Live, let's talk about all this on our roundtable. Joined by our uh, political analyst Matthew Dowd, GOP strategist CNBC contributor Sarah Fagan, Democratic Congressman Andre Carson, Republican Congressman Tom Cole, and Jennifer Palmieri, who served as communications director for Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Welcome to you all. And, and Matt, let me, let's begin. Constant news over the weekend on this executive order. Uh, you, you saw that refusal of a stay early this morning. But this is shaping up to be a real showdown between the administration and the courts. Very good chance it'll go all the way to the Supreme Court. Yeah, I'm mean, just stepping back a little bit. I mean, we're, we're drowning in tweets and we're thirsty for some sense of wisdom. And I think this is part of the problem when you have a president who's all about action and not about reflection or contemplation in any of this. So he gets himself involved in a situation where it's basically unvetted policy that gets put out there that has many constitutional problems in the course of this. When he needs victories and he needs to convince the public that he's actually going to pull or lead in a unified way, and every part of this continues to divide the country. Yeah, th th there's a, um, I think, an appreciation by his supporters that he is aggressive and moving quickly, and the spirit of what he's trying to do uh, is uh, prudent. But the way it was executed was so poorly that it makes it harder for him to bring people together to try to implement policy. I mean, the thing that, you know, when you're in an administration, particularly early in the stages, and you're trying to work with Congress, You've got to think every action has an impact down the road, and he needs to be doing things now that bring people together, not divide them, and he's not doing that. Well, and, 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 and Congressman Carson, I wonder if now, based on that uh, tweet we saw yesterday about the so-called judge, now if he gets a court uh, to agree with him, it raises the question, are they bowing to pressure from the executive branch? Well, in this case, thank God for the founding fathers who set up three separate branches of government in the Media Act and is the fourth estate. I mean, his impulsivity concerns me. He's fanning the flames of xenophobia and Islamophobia, and the American people are speaking out against it. Congressman? Look, I think uh, we've had two presidents in a row that tried to unite the American people, and both of them failed, quite frankly. Uh, I think uh, this president's decided he's going to get things done. That's how that's going to be his measuring rod. And it's been a, it was a bumpy rollout of the executive order, no doubt about it. They had to make changes afterwards, which goes to Matthew's point. They hadn't thought all of it through. But the basic point about being worried about these specific countries, being concerned about the security of the American people, and frankly, it polls pretty well if you wanted to use that as a measure. Uh, uh, I think, look, he's had a, an interesting opening two weeks, but I think he's going to be a lot more effective than most people give him credit for. Uh, there's a lot of process and style problems, but I think we should step back and, and note that he campaigned as a demagogue and he's presenting as a demagogue. And if you, if you were setting out to have uh, that be what your presidency was about, he has taken all the steps to do that. So at a substantive level, we should all be very... In terms of how they're operating in the White House, I understand... Um, uh, they had this chaos theory. This is just chaos. A good chaos theory means you have a disciplined strategy behind the scenes of how you're going to roll out policy, and then you do it in a way that inflicts chaos on the press and your opponents. But what they have done here is just is just chaos. And I understand that they're doing what their base wanted and they're keeping their base content. We're in the promise keeping business, you heard Vice President Right, Pence say. but what, the, what their problem is doing that um, first of all, they're doing it badly. It's bad policy, too. But they are igniting on our side. They are igniting an opposition um, and passion in the opposition that I, we have never, we have, literally, we have never seen in this country. Well, I, I think they're the main, more so than the Tea Party. Here, here's a bigger, I think, a huge problem that we exist today. First, they've misread the election, in my view. The Donald Trump and have misread. They, they think that the majority of the country is with them on these things. Maybe they don't care. Maybe they well, care about having their base solid, and that's enough to get through their policies. Well, here's the problem. Yeah. It's, that, that exists as long as Republicans don't start eventually peeling away, which will ultimately happen. It's happened to other Republican presidents when they've lost a big part of support. But my, my concern is this, is much of these policies are based on the fears of his base instead of the facts elements of this. And Ben Franklin said once, and I'm speaking of this executive power, Ben Franklin said, if you give up freedom to get security, you deserve neither. And in this case, there is no connected the dots to the seven countries he chose. There's no real connect the dots in, this, in, the, in the realm of this. And I have to say, you, everybody can say this isn't a Muslim ban. It is a Muslim ban. If I campaigned to say I want to keep the Irish out of the country, and then when I became president I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to keep people of Ireland out of the country. Everybody would know what it is. Oh, that's, just, think, that's not think, the case. Yeah, I mean, look, we have over 40 countries, majority Muslim countries, that aren't affected by this right. at all. If you look at these seven countries, ISIL is in a big part of those seven countries. You look at the governments, they mostly can't.
with us, even if they want to, and certainly in the case of Iran, they don't. You've got state sponsors of terrorism. Suggest this is a Muslim ban. That's just wrong. It, that's it's it's absolutely. But here's the thing. <laughs> Trump has a lot of business interest in the many of the countries who are not on the list. How do you explain that? Would you build businesses in Syria today? Has Would any, you build them in Somalia? Has a single today? terrorist that, 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 that is a single right. terrorist. That is egregiously. Tom, Tom, has, have no basis Tom is a to single terrorist from one of those seven countries committed an act in the United States. You, uh, by that definition, I guess we should... Uh, any country that has, you look them under a ban. Well, so you, why is you Saudi Arabia Arabia under Because the ban. you look at places where governments aren't functioning and can't help you vet people. He Do you think we can adequately vet people in Syria? He campaigned yeah. on, a, on a temporary Muslim yes. ban. This That's is, what he campaigned yeah. on. He also pulled back Look, from that. There are risks the in those countries. The but the, the bigger challenge for him, I think, is if you sort of step back and you think about the last 10 days, it's in many ways been the best of Trump and uh, the most challenging of Trump's actions. The best, you're saying the, the Supreme, Supreme Court, Court you know, from the great tactical move in the campaign of releasing the list and bringing conservatives to his side to the execution of a terrific judge, it's been a great, you know, period of time for him. And at the same time, you have this travel ban going on. And the confluence of these two things, you know, could make it such that, you know, he puts Gorsuch in a much worse position because if we end up in the Supreme Court on this travel ban, the politics of the court confirmation process, which is the most important thing to Donald Trump's base, the most important thing. And that's to me where the administration needs to step back and think and that's more strategically and, and, and that's more exactly broadly. Where Senator they could have went, waited three weeks on, or a month on this travel ban if it was that important to them. But I'm going to bring what you said about Judge Gorsuch to Jennifer. This is putting Democrats in a bit of a tough spot. Here's a judge who got a 99 to nothing right. voice, yeah. uh, basically a voice vote confirmation. He's got the support of liberals like Neil Katyal. And then what the Republicans are saying is it's up to the Democrats to decide whether you're going to pull that nuclear trigger right. or not and change the rules on uh, the Supreme Court. Yeah, I, mean, I think that you have to, Democrats have to uh, pull all the way back and not, and have a theory of the case about how they're going to be in opposition to this president. And I think they have an enormous burden on them and uh, they can't get, uh, I think they should follow the rules of our democracy. They're, the founders put good guard rules in place and they need to follow the rules, but they should not follow convention. So, so what does that mean? So that means, that means you, they have to do, they resist, but that's different than obstructing. So I think they have to do everything that is allowed under the Constitution, everything that's allowed under Senate rules to hold Trump accountable, to try to ferret out what this judge might really uh, think about presidential powers. Um, whatever the whatever is in front of them, they have to they have to push to the furthest uh, uh, spot that's allowed under the law, and that means not following convention. You know, convention would say that a president gets to pick their cabinet, and you largely defer to them. But um, in this case, when <laughs> when you have someone like Ben Carson who says, I don't think I'm qualified for the job. When you have somebody like uh, Governor Perry who said, who wanted to get rid of the department he's supposed to head, they shouldn't be confirmed. I, I, they have I, to, I, they can't get caught up in like what, ha how Republicans acted or how Democrats did it under uh, under President Bush. They have got to be as aggressive as possible in defending our democracy. I, I think, I mean, Washington always has a high level of hypocrisy, right? But I think the level of hypocrisy that has come out of the United States Senate on both sides of the aisle is amazing. So we, here's we have a Senate that basically Republicans didn't allow a vote on Merrick Garland, who was approved on his court of appeals by a Some majority Democrats of... Some Democrats say that's reason enough not to fill the court. Well, and, I, and I don't agree with that. So yeah. I think Republicans should have voted. It's their job to vote. It's their job to hold hearings and their job to vote and let the votes fall where they may. I think the Democrats, they ought to say we're going to do an extreme vetting on this, but we're going to put this up to a vote. It's going to be a vote, and that's what the Constitution says. Rule is, and you can't keep changing the rules based upon who holds political power. You don't power. have a vote. Where do you stand on this question? I agree uh, uh, to some degree. I think that um, this is a great lesson in civics for the American people. People are weighing in, but I actually share his, share his opinion.